I want to welcome you all here to the Silicon Valley Deep Learning Group and uh, Open Source Vision Foundation's first uh, meeting of 2019. It's fantastic to have you all here. So thank you for coming out and, uh, and enjoying us. Uh, we have a fantastic speak tonight, a fantastic speaker. Peter Norvig is going to be talking about the future of programming. But first, speaking of programming and our event programming, I'd like to introduce you to Amara Keel of Twilio, who's going to tell us a little bit about our fantastic hosts that we love very much, Twilio, who have sponsored this event for us. All right. Thank you, Adrian. First of all, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for coming. Apologies for the slight delay in getting you guys checked in. We'll work on that kink for next time. Um, Twilio is a company that provides APIs for communication. We fuel the future of communication. We are a developer-driven company. Um, if you need to use anything around communications, SMS, voice, video, we're the company that powers that. Um, let's get back into the speech because I don't think you guys came here for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, recruit, recruit, yeah. We are an awesome company. We're built by developers, for developers. If you like communications, if you like lots of data, if you like AI at the edge, hard challenges at hard scale, we are the company. We have offices in Mountain View, we have offices in San Francisco, we have offices globally, and we have an awesome, awesome team. Um, so look up twilio.com slash jobs. I'm on the meetup page, send me a resume. Um, but again, Thank you very much for coming. Really excited to host the group, and I will turn it over actually to you to finish up. All right. Thank you very much, Mayor, and thank you everybody from Twilio. By the way, you know Twilio also provided the, uh, the food and drink for us all here. Fantastic. Many others have done such and provided food and drink, but I think Twilio has really gone the extra mile and put out a really nice spread for us. So extra thanks to them. Let me now pass it on to Peter. Peter's going to talk tonight about programming, and he's going to talk a little bit about, I guess, the evolution of programming as it has been thus far and as he sees it in the future as AI becomes increasingly important in programming. All right, Peter, without further ado. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Twilio. So many of you may know that in 1945, Vannevar Bush wrote this very influential article, As We May Think, in which he invented the World Wide Web, basically. He said, uh, whole new forms of encyclopedias will appear ready-made with a mesh of associative trails. And uh, this was 1945, right? So uh, he didn't have an iPhone. Uh, he envisioned sort of this mechanical type of device where there's, uh, it looks like there's three iPads there, but those are really just uh, displays for cameras uh, and projectors, and it's all kind of mechanical. Uh, but uh, he, he saw this vision of a future where we would be relying on our tools much more. And this was sort of the start of the era of uh, software, of programming. So uh, where did we start? Uh, so this is an EDVAC computer, also from 1945. It's got uh, five kilobytes of storage, so each one of those racks you see is, is about one tweet. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so think about carrying that around in your pocket. Uh, and it was about a one millionth of a gigahertz uh, processor. And you programmed it by writing out tables like this, right? So it was even more primitive than, than assembly language. It was kind of which switch goes where. Uh, but we progressed very quickly. And, and within a decade or so, uh, we were writing Fortran like this. Uh, so we had much more advanced languages. We had much more advanced tools uh, like this. I'm old enough that I use one of these things. Uh, if you don't recognize it, it's a template. And you use a, a pencil, and you, you made flowcharts using that. So we built this profession of software using these languages and tools. And we built it primarily as a mathematical science based on logic and proofs. And you know, if you look at, at Edgar Dijkstra, he, he can show you how to do a proof. Let's be honest, none of us really does that, right? But, but we do write uh, assertions. We write assert true or we write assert equals. So we're proving sort of properties of our programs based on this very mathematical, logical, Boolean approach. And that served us well for 50 years or so. Uh, and so we have this model of a programmer. And this is Margaret Hamilton and this famous picture of her standing next to the code for the Apollo program that she helped to develop. 
And historical note, she was actually my boss in my very first job coming out of college. Uh, and so the job of a programmer is to tell the computer exactly what to do, step by step, here's what you should do, never deviate from that. And so essentially, the programmer is a micromanager. And, and believe me, you do not want Darth to be your manager. Uh, and now the question is, where are we today, and can we get past that? So today, uh, things have progressed, of course. There's lots of new programming languages. There's lots of new tools. And the role of what a programmer does has really changed from those early days, certainly from uh, 1945, but even from uh, 1980 or so uh, when I was getting my start. Right? So I remember when software tools meant you didn't have to write the square root function because you had one of those, right? But it, but it didn't go much beyond that. Uh, now what happens? Well, now you're a programmer, you get an idea. What's the first thing you do? Well, you go to Stack Overflow, of course, <laughs> and you copy a bunch of stuff, <laughs> right? So it used to be you wrote it by hand. Now, no, you just uh, kind of assemble it, and you, you write a little bit of stuff in between to glue it all together. Uh, and then you shove it into a computer, and now you have this machine that amazingly will do the things you want to do, right? So Vannevar Bush had to make a mechanical machine out of wires and cameras and so on, but, but we can make it just by downloading software and, and tweaking it a little bit. And now we have a machine, you give it the input, and it gives you the right output. So that means we've changed programming, right? It used to be this mathematical science where we said, uh, I can prove this property here. I know this loop is going to terminate because here's this termination condition. Now it's much more like a natural science, right? So I'm going in, in Stack Overflow, and I'm like David Attenborough, right? So I'm observing the world, and I say, oh, here's an interesting species, uh, Node.js. Uh, uh, I think I will observe that for a while, and I'll try to capture some and, and do something with it. And here's my field manual that says how this species operates, and I'll just follow this field manual, and then, oops, the field manual was wrong. I did this API call, and it didn't do exactly what it said it was going to do. So now I have to make a new scientific theory about what it actually does rather than what the manual said it was supposed to do. And that's what programming is like today, right? So most of what we're doing is making observations about this stuff that other people did and seeing if we can make it work together. Okay, so that's state of the art today. Where are we going? Well, of course, the big thing and the reason you guys are all here and, and part of this organization is that we see machine learning is changing the way we program. So now, we still have our computers, but rather than telling them step by step what to do, instead, we endow them with a, a flexible model, and we give them the ability to observe the world, and we give them the ability to change themselves. And, and that means we've changed everything. So now, we could do all these amazing things that you're all familiar with, uh, we can have it observe uh, the world through its sensors and become a self-driving car. We can have it observe uh, chess position and, and make great moves. And notice the progress we've made here in the past 20 years, right? So in 1997, uh, Deep Blue was, was able to beat Kasparov, and it did that with a lot of expert chess knowledge, right? So there were a lot of people who really knew what they were doing in chess saying, in this position, uh, you know, this bishop that's usually u worth three points is now worth four points because of these factors on the board. And it did it with uh, a lot of historical data. Uh, here's all the end games, here's the openings. Uh, and then it did it with uh, some algorithmic approach and this uh, idea of alpha beta search and all the, uh, the little tricks that go along with that. Now contrast that to 20 years later when with alpha zero, we can say, let's throw that all away. Let's fire all the chess experts. All we need to know is the rules of chess. Let's throw away all the history. We're not going to uh, cheat and look at what uh, past humans have done. We're just going to program in the rules, say the objective is to win, and then let the system play itself. Uh, and it turns out that does better than having all that expert knowledge. So does that mean uh, we're all out of a job? We don't need any of us experts anymore? Uh, no. 
uh, somebody still had to program it. Somebody, uh, there's still algorithms underneath. There's the deep learning algorithms. There's this tree search algorithm. There's reinforcement learning algorithms. And somebody had to have the good sense to say, to solve this problem, this makes sense. Right? So they said, yeah, we can have one program that will solve uh, Go, chess, and Shogi and do it better than any human. Uh, but some humans still had to decide this is what the architecture of that single one program is going to be and that those three games were, uh, were good for it, uh, but that when they wanted to play StarCraft, they would need a slightly different architecture. You couldn't do all of them with one approach, right? So there's still humans in the loop, but what we're doing is different. The tools we're using are different. We have a bunch of tools now, uh, and the approach is different. Right, so we said we went from a logical approach to a natural history approach, and now it's more like a hard science, right? So we're saying we're gathering data, we're exposing the system to data, we're doing experiments, uh, and moving from there. So that means maybe we need less programmers, you're writing less uh, for loops and if-then statements, and you're concentrating more on showing the machine the right data. And we've invented this idea of data science, which is, uh, in this famous uh, diagram from Drew Conway, says it's the intersection of these three skills. Uh, you have to be a little bit of a programmer, but not, maybe not quite as much as the professional programmers from the past. Uh, you have to know some math and statistics, maybe not quite as much as a professional statistician. And you have to know a little bit about the subject matter, whether it's medicine or finance or whatever it is you're dealing with. And the intersection of all three is data science. Uh, then uh, Joel Gruz uh, updated that a little bit uh, and added in a circle for, for evilness. Uh, and so some interesting things there. Uh, yes, I think it makes sense that the uh, thesis advisor is the person who has all those skills but forgot how to program. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and also, I think, uh, you know, on, on Conway's, he had uh, this idea of the uh, danger zone on the left there, of that if you knew how to program and you knew what you were do doing in the domain, but you didn't know any statistics, you could make mistakes. And that is true. Uh, but I kind of go, got to go with Joel here, saying it's maybe it's not all that dangerous after all, that uh, if you have enough data, you're probably not going to make that many serious statistical mistakes. Okay. So... But how much of these three skills do we really need, right? If somebody has to be an expert in three different things, uh, that's going to limit how far we can go. There's only so many people that can be trained up to that level. And so the real question is, can we dumb this down so that, uh, and people talk about it as, because uh, dumbing down doesn't sound that good, right? People talk about it as democratizing the field. That sounds much better, to make uh, anybody be able to be successful. So let's look at, uh, at that as a possibility. And I'm going to show just one example. Uh, so here's a guy in the, uh, named uh, Makoto Koki, and his parents were cucumber farmers uh, in, J in Japan. And they sort of expected he's going to take over the company farm, and he sort of expected, that doesn't sound like that much fun. Is there a way I can get out of it? And he said, uh, okay, what can I automate away? And one of the tasks was uh, sorting the cucumbers. Uh, so there's uh, all sorts of grades of cucumbers, and you have to put each one in the right bucket. And he said, maybe I can automate that. Maybe I can shove them down a conveyor belt, have a camera overhead, download TensorFlow, and teach it to sort cucumbers. Uh, he wasn't much of a domain expert. Uh, and he wasn't a professional programmer, but he, wasn't, uh, he was an engineer. I think he was in the automotive industry, and so he had some enough of those technical skills. Uh, he said, I'm going to take this on, right? And so here's the, uh, what is that, nine categories of cucumbers, and if you get one in the wrong bucket, the cucumber uh, uh, buyer isn't going to like you, so you've got to get these right. Uh, and he figured out how to train a network to do that. Now the question is, how much do you have to... How much do you need to know in order to successfully build this kind of a system? And here's the kinds of things that I think it would be reasonable to have to tell this system when you're building it. Uh, so you want to tell it that there's nine classes. Uh, maybe you could give it a hint and say, you know, uh, uh, vision system, we're under electric lights, uh, but there's also some sunlight that comes in, so take advantage of that. And it says, here's a really bad mistake. Don't classify this thing as that category, but other mistakes aren't as bad. 
uh, and then some other hints uh, about uh, what you should care about. Uh, last one, uh, say the background doesn't matter. Say you train, you've you built the system on a conveyor belt, and the conveyor belt is brown, uh, but then it breaks, and you replace the conveyor belt with a black one. You don't want the system's performance to go back to zero and have it to learn over. You want to be able to tell it ahead of time. No, I'm talking about the cucumbers here, not about the background. Uh, so if you could have a conversation where you said that, that would be quite reasonable. And we hope people, uh, you know, a, a sort of average technical person could have that conversation and be successful. But here's the kinds of things you do have to say that you really shouldn't have to. Uh, that there should be uh, 17 convolutional layers and the learning rate, you have to choose a value, and the batch size, and the loss function, and so on. And yeah, th there are defaults for some of these, but they all come into play. Uh, these are things you have to know about, and you shouldn't have to know about that. Right? So if we're going to democratize this field, we have to get to the point where you don't care about these things. You're just talking about the domain, you're not talking about these internal things. Uh, uh, here's some other things they don't want to have to say, right? So we should automatically augment the training images, uh, rotate them, and so on. Uh, we should figure out how to correct m mislabeling in the training data. Uh, if there's one of those nine classes was very unusual, uh, we should uh, correct for that type of distribution skew. Uh, we should, uh, if we're going to make errors of one kind versus another, we have to figure out uh, what kind of errors we want to make and what costs us the worst. And uh, is, it, is it worse to, uh, to disadvantage one class more than another class? Uh, we want to start off from some level of performance. So don't let me say, this is the first vision problem you've ever seen. Say, let's start with the best vision system we've ever had and then train it for cucumbers. So those are the kinds of things we want the system to do automatically, and we can, we're not there yet. We want to help with this whole process of data processing, right? And so I stole this slide from somebody who had the uh, data processing and data plus data wrangling equals success. So I think that's more or less right. And there was a seven-step process here. Uh, but I think m so much of what we focus on as technical people is in this model building step, right? We say that's where the action is. Of uh, You want to get the algorithm right, you want to get the model right. Uh, and the whole process is probably more important. And I see this over and over again when I s talk to startup companies. They say, oh yeah, you know, this, this deep learning stuff, it's really complicated and I'm going to spend a lot of time dealing with that and getting the model quite right. And then after the fact, they said, that was like 5% of the time, and 95% of the time was dealing with the data and fixing up errors in that and making the production system run continuously and all these other things around that key step in the middle. And then the other thing about that step is that's the part that's differentiable, and so that's great that you can go from the output of your model back to the input and correct for any errors. But the problem is that was only one part of this seven-step process. And before you did that, you made all these choices about how am I going to clean up my data. And you did that in a system that's not differentiable, and you can't feed the errors back and eliminate them. And if you did a good job, that's great. You made all the right choices. But then you sort of set them in stone or set them in code, in if-then statements, saying here's how I've altered my data and now I'm going to feed the input into the system and then it can go from the input to the output and differentiate back and, uh, and minimize the error. But it can't go back and redo the cleaning of the data. And so I think we have to build systems that are differentiable end to end to say I made this choice about how to clean my data but a year from now that choice might be the wrong one and I want the system to automatically notice and go back and make a better choice. Uh, eventually you run into these types of issues, but we want the system to do this automatically. We want it to know that every data point uh, is actually two data points, or uh, there's a model of what's going on. There's the true value, and then there's a measured value that has some uh, noise attached to it. And we shouldn't have to say that separately each time. We should have the system know these kinds of things. We should know that sensors can fail 
and then figure out a model for how the sensors are failing. It should know that uh, data entry that's done by humans can have certain types of errors, and it should have a catalog of human biases and mistakes and so on. And currently, all these things, uh, as a field, we can correct for them. We can figure out them, and we, and we can get back of them. But we're doing it over and over again. And when we build a new system, we're starting from scratch, rather than saying, we already learned how to do this last time. Let's save that uh, and use it again, rather than do it from scratch. Uh, here's a paper I'd like to call Machine Learning, the High Interest Credit Card of Technical Debt. Right, so technical debt is this idea of uh, when you're in a startup company and you're going fast, you cut a lot of corners and you say, uh, okay, long term, this isn't going to be very uh, scalable, uh, but uh, we need to get something out today. So we're just going to do this and it's hacky, but uh, live with it. And then eventually, you know, you got to go back, and clean it up. And the idea of machine learning is it allows you to go so fast that you make more and more of those types of mistakes and you have more and more to clean up. So. Uh, what are the risk factors? Uh, so one thing is that these complex models erode the uh, boundaries between modules. That in a good software design, you break things up into components, and when something goes wrong, you know where that is. Uh, but with machine learning, everything's mushed together. Uh, you may have a deep learning model with multiple levels, but there's no clear boundary between them. Uh, and that makes it harder to debug. Another thing is that data dependencies cost more than code dependencies, right? So I, I showed very briefly the history of our programming languages. And mostly what we've done over the last 50 years is say, we want to build a language that makes it harder for you dumb programmers to insert bugs into your code, which we know that's what all the programmers want to do. We've done a pretty good job of that, right? So it used to be you, it was easy to pass the wrong type into a function. Uh, now, most of the time, that's a compile error. Uh, so we're getting better at eliminating errors in code, but we haven't gone very far at eliminating errors in data. You can have all sorts of problems with your data, and there's nothing there to tell you what's going on. A couple other issues there, but let's, let's skip that, and I'll go to an example. Uh, so this is a problem. Uh, that showed up at Google. It was before I was there, so you can't blame me. Uh, and we had a bunch of URLs, and we had a blacklist that says these are pages that shouldn't go into the index, right? So some stuff that was just so bad we didn't want anybody to ever see it. Some stuff that was, say, infinite, right? So there's like a calendar, and it has the next day or the next month button. And if you kept pressing that button, you'd keep going on into infinity. So we said we probably don't want to index calendar pages for a million years into the future. So I put that on the blacklist and lots of other stuff. Uh, and then one day somebody said, oh, you know, we're indexing all these uh, CGI scripts, uh, which is, you know, sort of before we had JavaScript, uh, there were these pages that ran usually Perl programs. Uh, we said, we probably don't need to index the Perl programs because they look like line noise anyways. So somebody added these two uh, lines to the end of this file and expected their job is done. And then uh, one of the engineers had gone to McGill University, got a call from his professor and said, how come every page from McGill has been removed from the index? <laughs> <laughs> Who can figure it out? Well, it turned out, uh, remember I, I said uh, Perl, right? So uh, uh, Perl has had this property that in the programming language you could write a regular expression just by putting slashes around it. And so the person that wrote the format for this data file of blacklists said, maybe you're doing that. So if there's a slash at the beginning at the end of a line, we'll just drop those slashes because you, you probably didn't mean them. Those, those are probably just delimiters, not part of uh, the content. And so that meant every URL that had the three consecutive characters CGI was dropped from the index. Right, so that's a bad mistake, uh, and we fixed it. But that's the kind of thing that happens all the time in data, right? And mistakes like that probably wouldn't happen as often in code because something would catch it, right? We've had all these years of, of writing error message for compilers, and we're good at catching bugs in code. But we allow all these bugs to slip into our data. And so we need a, we need a better science of how we're going to write data and how we're going to deal with that. So McGill got eliminated, and eventually we brought it back. Okay, 
So that's one idea uh, that machine learning allows us to do more, but we need better tools around it, specifically around the data. Another thing we want to be able to say is uh, to reason probabilistically rather than logically. All right, so so much of our languages are uh, logical. We have if statements, uh, which are true fault. Uh, but when we're dealing with AI, we're dealing with uncertainty, uh, we don't want just true faults. We want probabilities. And we want to be able to reason from evidence in a good way, and we want to be able to do that in any direction. Right? So in most of our programming languages, we reason from inputs to outputs. Uh, there are a few exceptions. Uh, so languages like Prolog al are, uh, allow you to go in both directions. And recently, we've had this progress in what we call probabilistic programming that allows you to do that again. Uh, you say you build a model of how the variables are related to each other. And then you say, I observe one value. And now I say, what could have got me there? And essentially, you run a simulation of the program to say, uh, I've observed, instead of observing an input variable, I observe an output variable what input variables must have been true or were likely true in order to produce that output. And the idea is that it looks more like a program, right? So we could always, do, we did this 30 years ago with like uh, Bayesian networks, but that didn't look like a program. That looked like a data structure. Now we can do it with the full power of a programming language, but the flexibility of being able to operate in any direction. So here we're, we're sort of describing a model of what's going on. Now we can just say, well, simulate that and then we can plot the results of, of where it is. Uh, and I think there's a lot that's going to be done in that direction. It frees us up. It makes a better match to machine learning problems, to AI problems, to say, let's get away from the Boolean logic and go towards uh, random variables rather than programming language variables. Uh, now, I talked about, uh, I didn't want to call it dumbing down, I wanted to call it democratization. Uh, and so we want less skilled programmers. Uh, and there's this whole uh, group of people who can maybe form a query to access a database, or maybe can mess around with a spreadsheet for a while and write a uh, one-line macro, but they're never going to write a 100-page program. What can we do for them? Right? So we'd like to be able to extend this type of query language to allow them to do more sophisticated things. So here's an example. Uh, let's say you want to uh, mail out uh, a mailing to all your customers uh, in the demographic of age 24 to 36 and income greater than 70,000. And so you want to just write this SQL query, but the problem is uh, you haven't actually asked any of your customer what their age or income is you're going to try to infer that from the data you already have, from their past pat patterns of purchases or whatever. So probably we can build a system where you write a query just like this, and then it figures it out. And it makes its best guess for each customer. Is it likely within this age range? Is it likely within that income range? And if it gets a few wrong, no big deal, right? You've missed sending a few spam emails to some customers, and you sent a few extra ones. That's OK you mostly hit the people you wanted to hit. And so this would be a great interface for problems like that. But here's another one. Let's say you've got these electronic medical records, and you have a certain patient, and you say, now let's select the diagnosis and the treatment for this particular patient. And here, what you don't want to do is try to treat these variables as if they were in the database and retrieve that one record, right? Because if it's a database query, there can only be one answer. No, you want a differential diagnosis, right? You don't want to say it's 51% uh, likely that he has this disease, therefore I'll return that and forget all the other possibilities. Uh, a doctor just doesn't operate that way. They say, I want to go down. You know, I don't want to see the 0.01% possibility. But if there's a 50% and a 30% and a 20%, I want to see all of those. And I, maybe I'll make a, a treatment that treats all three possibilities. And so now we've broken this uh, SQL model. It no longer looks like this is a single database. It looks like there are multiple possible values in each field. And so we've made things complex again. And the question is, can we figure out how to do that in such a way that we could present that to the user in a way that makes sense to them, that isn't too complicated. 
And, you know, maybe we can do that. Uh, probabilistic programming does it with uh, Monte Carlo simulation of you try a bunch of things, and then you have some nice way of summarizing the result. Uh, and so it's partially a, qu a question of how do you do that inference, and then partially a question of what's the right way to present that? What's the user interface to make this complex idea of, I don't know exactly what the values are, there's, there's multiple possibilities, how can you make that clear and simple to a doctor who just says, I just want to know the answer. And so, uh, you know, essentially what you want to say is find all the treatments that have no bad effects that are an approximate cover for all the, the diagnoses. Okay. Uh, here's another problem I wanted to go over. So, uh, again, something not my problem. Uh, I used to work at NASA, and uh, right when I showed up, we had a failure uh, for this spacecraft called the Mars Climate Orbiter. You may remember that. And there was a, uh, a mix-up between uh, using uh, imperial and metric units that caused the craft to come in. Uh, uh, I can't quite read it there. Uh, mm. Came in at fi 57 kilometers when it should have came in at, uh, at 220 kilometers or something like that. So that's pretty good, right? Out, out of, uh, uh, what is it, uh, uh, half a billion miles, you only miss by uh, 100 or so. That, that's, uh, not, what, five nines of accuracy? That's pretty good, uh, but we lost the spacecraft. Uh, and, uh, you know, so why did we do that? So I think part of the problem was that we were, uh, we weren't dealing enough explicitly with uh, probability. We were saying, uh, you know, tell me where you think the spacecraft is, and that's going to be the answer. And people all along sort of felt like, uh, you know, there's something a little bit screwy with these numbers. They aren't the way they usually are. It's off by a little bit. Uh, but no alarms went and said, uh, you know, this is out of bounds, uh, not because uh, of the position, but the position is really close to where it should have been, but it's out of bounds because it doesn't match the model of what we'd expect to see. Uh, the variance is too high. And, and nobody was tracking that explicitly. I think part of the problem also was that the team was split between JPL in Pasadena and Lockheed Martin in Colorado. And my feeling is if they had been co-located, two people would have sat down together at lunch and figured it out. Uh, <laughs> but because they weren't, it was, oh, I sent an email, you didn't respond, uh, you must think it's okay. And, uh, oh, you didn't send me a second email, you probably figured it out. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, that's the way to lose a couple hundred million dollar spacecraft. <laughs> okay, so those are all things we can do better. And I talked about uh, making it simpler. So the simplest thing that uh, almost everybody can do is conversation. So what if I didn't have to know how to program? I didn't have to know how to do even a spreadsheet level or SQL query level. What if I could just talk to my machine, right? That seems like a great future. And how close are we getting to that? Uh, so I saw this thing the other day saying how to create a voice menu your customers will love. And I didn't click through to read the article, but I know what the answer is. Don't, because <laughs> nobody has ever loved one of those systems, <laughs> right? But we still build them, and we say, you know, press one for this and press two for that, and everyone gets frustrated. So we know that's the wrong technology. And I, and I think part of the reason it's wrong is that it's built too much on traditional programming. You know, if this, then one. If that, then two. Uh, and that's not the right model because people just don't want to fit into that tree. They don't know where you're going with your tree. They know what their problem is. Uh, but we do have examples of conversation that work, uh, at least in fiction, where uh, you can have a believable conversation and you can fall in love with your conversationalist uh, and, and everything's great. Uh, we're not there yet, but how close are we getting? Well, we do have everybody carrying around one of these very, very capable devices, and we have the ability for them to load lots of stuff onto them. And uh, the major players now, the Googles and Apples and, and Amazons and Microsofts, are trying to build these conversational agents. Uh, and for some things, they work great, right? So if I want to set an alarm, if I want to see a recipe when I'm in the kitchen, if I want to know what the weather is, uh, it's perfect. 
what else can I do? Well, I'm starting to get to a, at a loss, right? Because I don't know what else I can do. And part of it is uh, some of it doesn't work, and part of it is I just don't have a good model of what will work and what won't work. Uh, and the other part is, as an insider, I know how they build these interactions, uh, and it's scary, right? And so it's all built like this. So we say you can build an action by, again, having this kind of flowchart-like action that if the user says this, then do that. And if the user follows exactly the same tree, it's a little bit more flexible than pressing one to see, talk to an agent, uh, but not much more. Uh, and so this is not going to succeed. We're going to need a better model for how companies build these things. Uh, if they can build them, I think there is a great opportunity, right? So, you know, going back here, uh, if I want something, say I want uh, a car to show up outside to take me somewhere, I know I have to press one of these uh, little squares, and I decide, do I want to press the Lyft square or the Uber square or, or something else? And once I do that, I'm in communication exactly with them, and, uh, and they've tailored that interaction so that is a good one. And mostly they do a pretty good job. Uh, but we'd like to be in a model where instead I just say, hey, I need a car, and my system goes off and figures out how to do that. And so it's having the conversation. And this diagram I'm saying schematically, uh, maybe it's going off to some intermediaries and then they're having the conversation, right? So it could be this whole ecosystem of uh, the systems talking to each other and trying to figure out and trying to figure out what data about me am I willing to share? Uh, you know, so uh, I'm willing to say, uh, yeah, this is what my location is, but maybe I don't want to share my location with everybody. Maybe it, they have to be trusted in some way before I do that. And so schematically, this is saying uh, I may have intermediaries that know what I want to share, what I don't share, and know who's trusted and not trusted. But they've still got to have these conversations back and forth. And, and I'm pretty convinced uh, if we see more of this, we'll take a step backwards. And I remember uh, when the World Wide Web was first being developed, it was at a time when we had uh, desktop apps and you could click on a menu item and something would happen to your file. And now someone said, oh, well, yeah, you, you could do that on your desktop app, but, but look, this is so cool. You can now do this in the cloud. You can edit your document or your photo or whatever uh, in the cloud. And look, here's a web page. And you click on this web page. And in only 12 seconds, the web page will refresh, and then you <laughs> could do the next action, right? And that's what it was like, but people thought it was cool because it was different. And then eventually, we got it to the point where it was fast again. So I think this is what's going to happen uh, for these apps. If these conversational agents uh, become even more popular, we'll take a step backwards in usability, in user interface, because there's no one person that's responsible now. Right? It's uh, this system of interactions, and we're not going to know how to script those to look nice. Uh, so they, they'll no longer look as nice, but at least they'll be sort of more on my side. Right? When I press the Uber button, I'm completely at the mercy of Uber. But if I'm talking to my assistant, you know, I may feel more like, well, th this assistant's on my side, and it's its problem to deal with Uber or Lyft or, or whoever else. So I don't know if these uh, systems are going to take over. I don't know if five years from now most of your interaction is going to be talking to your agent or if you're still going to be uh, clicking on those app buttons. But it's interesting that it's a different model. Um, and I would also like to be able to do more, right? So yes, I can say, what's the weather? And, and I'll get a good answer. But here's a good example. Uh, so I was in New York and, you know, in New York, you got to walk a lot, and I wasn't quite sure how far I had to walk. And I said, you know, I remember there used to be a little scale bar on my map, but apparently that's gone. And, and I bet some user interface person did a study and said, yes, almost all the time, it's the right thing to not have the scale bar there. And, and I believe that that study was right. But for me right now, <laughs> it was wrong. And what I really want to be able to do is say, uh, okay, Google, put the scale bar back. Uh, but I can't do that, right? It can't answer that question. There's a bunch of questions it can answer, but that's not one of them. Uh, and so I did a little research, and I said, yeah, I could put it back. 
So I went to Google, which led me to Stack Overflow, which showed me 200 lines of Java and 20 lines of configuration files, and I could get root access to my phone and load those in, and I could bring it right back. Uh, but that's not quite the same as saying, uh, okay, uh, uh, give it back to me, right? And I think, uh, so again, this part of this issue that a lot of the artifacts we have are not part of our programs, and because of that, they're lost. Right, so somebody did a great, I assume, user interface study saying this is the right answer. This is how the user interface should be. And if you had to pick one, I trust that they did the right job. But the right, but one isn't right for everybody. And what we should have is rather than saying here's this paper document that made these choices and then the programmers went off and implemented just the one thing, let's have that whole thing be an electronic document that everything's connected to everything else. And if you say, now I want to change one of the assumptions. The assumption was uh, this scale bar isn't useful. Now switch that to say, to me it is useful. And if you make that switch, now what does the user interface become? And if that was all sort of executable code, then we could do that. But it's not. It's a written document. It's a report. And so it's lost. Uh, so I hope we can move programming to capture all the documentation, all the reasoning, all the ex user interface experiments and so on. So they all become part of the system that's changeable and updatable. Uh, we have a huge issue with privacy, security, and, and fairness, right? So every time you hear about a new app, you, uh, you download it and this page comes up and says, uh, I want permissions to do all these things. And uh, me, as an expert computer user, says, I don't know what you're talking about. Sure, go ahead. And uh, if it seems kind of fishy later, I'll just delete it, right? And, uh, and, and probably there's a couple of you in the audience that are, are more uh, uh, sophisticated or paranoid about it that maybe check a little bit better. But for most people, that's all we do, right? And it's because we built this terrible security model that doesn't allow us to do anything better, right? And I should be able to say, here's how I want to be safe. Just make sure you do that for everything. Okay, uh, one more part, which is programming with uh, utility functions, right? So we start off by saying, in the old days, we told the computer what to do step by step. Now we d we're saying with machine learning, we're more specifying what the objective is rather than what the steps are. And machine learning figures it out. Now the problem is, now we have a different problem. Instead of saying what to do, we have to say what is it that we want. And you may think that seems easy, uh, but it's not. And we have various legends in our culture. So there's the King Midas legend. King Midas thought what he wanted is for everything he touched to turn to gold. But when he touched his daughter, he found out, oops, I made a mistake. That wasn't what I wanted. And there was no undo button. Uh, and uh, in the Terminator, we thought we wanted our uh, computer systems to be able to protect us from enemy missiles, uh, but we realized we programmed them to uh, take over, and that was a mistake. So the question is, how do we avoid these types of mistakes? So we said we don't want programmers to be micromanagers saying step by step, here's what you should do. So what are they instead? Uh, and here's a couple models. We may think of them as teachers. We teach what to do, and then you learn from that. We may think of them as generals who step back and are the opposite of micromanagers. Uh, so General Patton said, don't tell people how to do things, tell them what to do, and let them surprise you with their results, right? So he said, give them a utility function, and then they'll do uh, reinforcement learning and figure out what the right steps are to capture that hill or whatever it is you wanted them to do. And the reason he said that is because he, in the fog of war, like us, doing AI is primarily concerned with uncertainty, right? If there's no uncertainty, then it makes sense to say, yeah, go ahead and tell me what to do step by step. But if there's uncertainty, conditions are changing on the ground, uh, then you don't want to do that. Instead, you want to say, where am I headed? Not what steps do I have to take to get there? So a general, I think, is a good model. And we have to turn to philosophers. We have to get away from this hard science towards philosophers. So here's two of my favorite philosophers. And of course, Mick on the right is uh, more famous for his quotation about what we should want uh, versus what we need. Uh, but I actually think Mick's got it exactly wrong. 
And I think our Nobel laureate, Bobby, there on the left, uh, uh, has the right direction. Because these are the kinds of things that we need, but we've built this whole ecosystem that allows us to vote for what we want with our clicks, and this is what we said we wanted. <laughs> and I play Angry Birds for a bunch of hours, and then I say, oh man, that, that was stupid. I wish I had those hours back. And of course, I don't, I don't have a time machine. But it's even worse. It's not just me. It's now I've infected all of you because each one of my clicks is a vote, and that means the system is more likely to be recommended for somebody else, and it's a virus. And then you get it, and then uh, you use it, and you're making recommendations for someone else. Uh, and we end up with all this stuff we don't want because we built this marketplace around exploiting our, our wants and desires without really thinking about what our deep needs are. And so I think that's the ultimate question, right? So we've gone away from saying, here's what you do step by step, to saying, here's what we're trying to achieve. But if we're aiming the whole system at achieving the wrong goals, uh, then that isn't worth doing. So we've got to figure out a different type of marketplace that will aim us all as a society in the directions we really want to go, rather than the directions we're forcing it now. So why don't I stop there and open it up for questions. Right. Yeah. So the, so the question is, uh, are, are the assistants really on your side? And, and one of the examples was uh, being clever about uh, breaking up one Uber ride into two. Uh, and of course, we know that, uh, that Uber isn't, isn't going to be on your side, right? So uh, it wants to maximize its revenue. Some of it is maximizing long-term revenue, so they want to treat you nice in the short term. Uh, but they won't necessarily find you the best deal, un unless they think you're really price sensitive, uh, then, then, then they may try to do that. Uh, so uh, the question that I, I think of, or I, I guess that I want to answer, is uh, can you really trust your assistant, right? And I guess it's what it comes down to is now are you going to trust uh, your Amazon or Google or Microsoft or, or Apple? Uh, and I think you'll know in the back of your mind, yeah, to some degree, these systems are working for these companies. They're not working uh, just for me. Uh, but you probably feel like, uh, well, it c when it comes to me versus Uber, uh, then I can trust that the, that the assistance is on my side, at least versus Uber, because it has no uh, set positive relation with that. Oh, you know, over the long term, yeah, the assistant wants you to stay with that assistant and not swap to somebody else. Uh, so in some sense, uh, it's not completely on your side. It's not going to say, hey, you know what? I, th I think Siri's better uh, for you, or I, you know, uh, that, that's probably not going to happen that much. Uh, and so uh, I think these, these companies will be competing with each other. Uh, I think it'll be very interesting to see how much these open up, right? So uh, to answer a different question, I, I often get asked, uh, well, in this age of cloud computing, uh, aren't we uh, just concentrating all the power in a small number of hands, that the people who can afford to have huge data centers? Uh, and I think that's not true. I think these companies have uh, made an investment in gathering a lot of data, and I think they'll want to amortize that investment by sharing it as much as possible. So we may come to a place where uh, you know, the large companies say, yeah, we'll offer you an assistant, but we'll off also offer access to all the data we have, and third-party companies can build assistants on top of that. Uh, and then if, you know, there's not just three or four players in that marketplace, but uh, dozens or hundreds, uh, then I feel y you, you probably feel better about saying, I can pick one uh, that I trust more to be on my side. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's a huge problem, and, and uh, I know some companies that are uh, especially thinking about that in the uh, developing world, uh, where you have other challenges. One is, uh, you know, individual customers don't have uh, much of a record, so how do you know who you can trust and who you can loan to? And secondly, uh, there may be a lot of volatility in the currency, and so uh, they're thinking about hedges of, you know, should I invest in uh, foreign cur currency as well, or, or in uh, blockchain, or whatever? 
so I think people are thinking about this kind of at a global level. Uh, and, you know, and there's always moves you can make to uh, kind of flatten out your risk. Uh, but, but I don't think we have all the answers yet. Good three from programming. Yeah. Yeah, so the, so the question is in education and uh, how do we get kids prepared for this type of world or possible future world? And, and it's hard, right? So part of the problem is it's hard to get uh, teachers that have the skills to be able to teach that. I know at, at Google we've had a program, uh, uh, sort of a summer program, where we can bring teachers in and teach them how to teach computer science. And, and some of the schools really love that and have been very uh, thankful to us. Uh, some of the schools complain. They say, I sent you our best teacher and she got trained up in programming and then she got a job that pays three times as much and she quit and, <laughs> and now we lost our best teacher, right? Uh, that's a societal problem that's going to be hard uh, for us to fix. Uh, there is this big emphasis now on learning to code, uh, which in, in some ways is really great. I, w I wish it w the message was slightly different because I think learning today's programming languages, uh, you know, when you're six or 10 or 12 years old, maybe that's not going to help very much when you're 25 years old. Uh, so I would rather have it something like uh, uh, learning to model or learning to problem solve. And that uh, here, here's some coding examples that can help you do that, but uh, think of that as only one tool towards these deeper skills rather than think of it as a, an end in itself. Anything that like that you recommend or anything that gets close to that? No, I mean, there's so many of them now. So, and I, I usually tell people, uh, just try a couple out and see what works for you. Yeah, uh, so the question is, uh, how do we understand the, the human mind? Uh, and that's important because we, we want to have good user interfaces. And when we're meeting people more halfway, we better understand them better, right? So if it's, uh, you know, if the user interface is, uh, here's a hammer, it doesn't take long to teach a person uh, how to use it, uh, and they do most of the work. And if it's, uh, here's an application and it's got 10 menu items, uh, they can eventually figure out what those items are. But if it's, we're going to have a conversational assistant and everything's open-ended, uh, now you really better understand uh, what's happening when you're talking to someone because uh, it's now mixed initiative rather than making the human do all the work. Uh, so, I mean, we have a, a, a science of user interface design and user experience design, and, and that gets part of the way there. Uh, but I think we need to understand better uh, what is it that, uh, that people want? Uh, how do they speak, right? So we're, we can do certain things with natural language, but we're a long ways off from taking full advantage of that. Uh, I think uh, having more sensors and understanding their uh, body motion and their eye gazes and so on, and, you know, and maybe other biometrics like uh, heart rate and so on, you can tell more of, you know, are they engaged? Are they bored? Did they understand? what you just said. Uh, so it'll be a combination of, uh, of hardware sensors, software uh, that's more aware, and uh, a better sort of physiological understanding and, and uh, mental understanding of, of what people are, are, where they are now, and what they want. Let's take one more question. Peter, Kay. So, so I think there's a couple things that make it hard. One is a lot of actions that these apps take are completely hidden from the user, right? And so, uh, you know, an app asks, uh, can I have access to your contacts? And I say, yeah, that makes sense because the app is an email app or something. And yeah, sure, I, I can see how you need that. Uh, but then it starts uh, spamming all my contacts uh, <laughs> every day. I said, no, you know, I didn't expect that. Uh, so, uh, so how can we combat that type of issue, right? So one would be to, to make these actions more visible, right? To, to require the system to sort of have a little display of this, uh, this app is now doing something. 
And the question is, can we do that in such a way that is not completely distracting, but that you notice, hey, this seems reasonable behavior, this seems bad behavior. Uh, another way we can do it is with the more finer grained uh, capability model. So rather than saying you have access to all my apps, uh, say, uh, uh, you know, we'll start off, you don't have anything, and then you can start asking, and then I'll start noticing. And uh, maybe I'll have a good way to say, yeah, you can do more of these, uh, but now if you try something different, uh, it has to ask again. Uh, and I think in general, uh, we've made the mistake of saying in computers, it's like, uh, uh, you know, we were counting zero, one, many, and once we allow you to have access to one, we allow you to have any, right? And so uh, we just shouldn't do it that way, right? So you see all these uh, security breaks where uh, somebody downloads a million uh, uh, database entries, uh, and there's no stop for that, right? And uh, I think the problem is that we just aren't used to that, because in the physical world, that doesn't happen, right? So if, if you're Walmart, you can say, uh, yeah, it's okay if every now and then somebody comes in and uh, they steal an undershirt and they walk out with it. I'll, I'll accept those losses. But what you don't expect is it's just as easy to steal one undershirt as it is to steal every garment from every store simultaneously. <laughs> right? And they don't realize that we built our online systems so that they're like that. Right? Uh, but we don't have to build them that way. We could build them so that uh, we're not saying you have access to this file. We're saying you can make one request. And now if you make another request, yeah, we'll let a couple go by. But when you start making too many, we're going to cut you off or, uh, or at least throttle you or, or do something rather than making it just as easy to get everything as it is to get one. So I think there's a lot of steps we could make, but we, we don't make them because we want the systems to you know, be as efficient or as easy to use as possible rather than to be as uh, defensive as possible.